tonight we're going to close out 1 Samuel, so let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this time we can spend in your word, and we ask you, Lord, to bless it to our hearts, teach us through it, and we're grateful for your grace and your love and your mercy over us. Be glorified, Lord, as we study together and help us to apply these things that we learn. It's in Jesus' powerful name that we pray. And everybody said, amen. So to kind of wrap up where we are, bringing uh, 1 Samuel to a close, uh, David has been on the run from King Saul for some 15 years now because Saul has been very um, threatened by David's popularity. And David has already been anointed since around the age of 10 or 12 by the prophet Samuel to be the next king of Israel. But David is waiting for God's perfect timing. And 1 Samuel is going to conclude with the end of Saul's reign because it's going to be the end of Saul's life. So David is about ready to step into being king, but he's not going to become crowned king immediately. There's going to be some tension within Israel. It's going to be some things he has to overcome. But because the, by the time we get here to chapter 29, because David has been on the run from King Saul for some 15 years, he is weary. And Saul, in chasing him, has wearied himself. And they have both become desperate men. David has become so desperate in running from Saul that in chapter 27, David goes to Philistine territory and joins the cause of the Philistines. Remember, the Philistines are perennial enemies of the Israelites. But he's so desperate in trying to run from Saul that he wants to leave the territory of Israel and he goes over towards what today on a map would be like the Gaza Strip area along the Mediterranean, the territory of Gath, and the, the king there is Achish, and he goes there to find refuge, and he basically appeals to the king uh, of Gath, Achish, and he says, listen, I know I'm an Israeli, I, I know I've, I killed Goliath, I know I have a reputation of being a fierce warrior, but I'm going to serve you, because I'm running from Saul, I'm tired of running from Saul, so I'm going to serve you. There's a very, very um, downtime in David's life. He is clearly outside of the will of God. You don't, you don't fraternize with the enemy uh, trying to escape God, you know, or what God's plan is for your life. But this is how desperate he's become, that he's actually in Philistine territory, he's in enemy territory, and he is actually going to fight on behalf of the Philistines. So it's a very desperate, dark, and, and terrible time in David's life. But equally desperate in Saul's life, because he is so weary for, from chasing David that in chapter 28, Saul resorts to consulting a witch who lives in Endor. And mediums and witch, witches and um, demonic uh, tapping into the occult has been completely outlawed by God in the book of Leviticus. And Saul, up to this point, had rid the land of of Satanists and uh, witches and witchcraft and the occult. But now he's in this dark place himself. And so he goes, he sneaks in, under the cover of night, and he consults this witch in chapter 28 because he wants her to bring up Samuel, the prophet, who was the last of the prophets to, uh, during the period of the judges to die. And so Saul wants wisdom. And what is he doing? He's trying to consult a witch who's going to bring up the spirit of Samuel to give Saul wisdom. Now, as I mentioned last time, um, there's great debate as to whether or not this is actually Samuel who appears to Saul. And there's arguments on both sides. Uh, this is just demonic because it was a witch involved and uh, she brought him up. And so uh, it, it doesn't appear that this is uh, actually Samuel, but then there's arguments on the other side. And I lean towards the other argument that the witch is so startled by the appearance of Samuel, it seems to indicate this was unexpected, that she normally conjures up demons and this one was not so. And that also Samuel, when he appears to King Saul, he prophesies. You never see in the Bible where demons uh, or these uh, satanic spirits who mimic someone ever prophesy, at least not in an accurate way. What Samuel says or what the appearance of this ghost is to Saul is 100% accurate in the different things that he prophesies. And it has to do with Saul, and it has to do with the impending death of Saul, it has to do with the defeat of the Israelites by the hands of the Philistines. So, I lean towards the side that this is a, a, an unusual 
um, singular time when God actually allowed the spirit of someone to come up to appear to actually rebuke Saul and to rebuke the witch. Um, remember when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah appeared just spiritually. So it, it isn't like um, completely unheard of. You see it also in the New Testament where God allowed the spirit of Moses and Elijah to appear with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Whatever your opinion is about what happened in chapter 28 with the witch of Endor, the point is David is desperate, Saul is desperate, and things are about ready to come to a head. That's where we are now into chapter 29. So if you'll read with me chapter 29, it says, Then the Philistines gathered together all their armies at Aphek, and the Israelites encamped by a fountain which is in Jezreel. And the lords of the Philistines passed in review by hundreds and by thousands. But David and his men passed in review at the rear with Achish. Remember, he's the Philistine king of Gath, Achish. And then the princes of the Philistines said, what are these Hebrews doing here? Okay, so, so David and his men, and he has 600 at the time of, of Israelites, they're marching with the Philistine army. Now, Achish is on board with this. Achish has taken a liking to David, and he's giving David cover, and he's giving David a place of refuge away from Saul. And of course, Achish, as the king of the Philistine territory, is happy to have David with him, because if you're uh, my ally, you're not my enemy. And he knows that David has a reputation of being a mighty man who defeated Goliath in Israel. So what, you want to defect? You want to come over and be with me? Of course he welcomes that. So Achish is on board with it, but not his Philistine lords or princes. He's got some military officials with him, and they object. They turn around and they see David and his 600 men at the rear of the Philistine army, and these Philistine lords say to King Achish, why are these Hebrews here? They, these guys can't be marching with us. Read on. It says, And Achish said to the princes of the Philistines, Is this not David, the servant of Saul, king of Israel, who has been with me these days or these years? And to this day I have found no fault in him since he defected to me. But the princes of the Philistines were angry with him. So the princes of the Philistines said to him, Make this fellow return, that he may go back to the place which you have appointed for him, and do not let him go down with us to battle, lest in the battle he become our adversary. For with what could he reconcile himself to his master, if not with the heads of these men? Is this not David, of whom they sang to one another in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands? And so these Philistine princes, they argue with the king, and the king is gracious enough to let them argue with them. And they say, you can't have this guy marching with us. Who knows? By the time we get over to Israel and start fighting the Israelites, he might likely change mind. Or maybe he's a double agent who we don't know. And he's going to turn on us and cut our own heads off. This isn't right. Now, F.B. Meyer, F.B. Meyer in his commentary, he says about this, and I'm, I'm not quoting him directly, but I'm, I'm paraphrasing. F.B. Meyer said, basically, with the Philistines representing the world, okay, and the Israelites, or David and his men, in this case, representing God's people. F.B. Meyer said, and again, I'm paraphrasing, it's a sad day when the world is smarter than the church. Because the Philistine lords realize this is not right. David shouldn't even be with us. David should be on that side. Why is he fighting with us? This isn't right. And so I'm going to I'm going to turn what F.B. Meyer said and and make it uh, more kind of in a positive uh, sense. And and here it is: God's people should always be better than the world when it comes to knowing and doing what is right. If if the world, if worldly people are telling you and me something that we should already know better, that's a sad day. That's a sad day. We should be so tuned into the Lord. And what he says is right and what he says is wrong and then obeying him, we, we shouldn't, the world shouldn't be smarter, not in terms of what's right and what's wrong. And so David is a picture of this. And so here's what happens. 
Then, verse 6, then Achish called David and said to him, Surely as the Lord lives, you have been upright, and you're going out, and you're coming in with me in the army as good in my sight. For to this day I have not found evil in you since the day of your coming to me. Nevertheless, the Lord's do not favor you. Therefore, return now and go in peace that you may not displease the lords of the Philistines. So David said to Achish, but what have I done? Okay, he's going to whine here. Hope there's a little cheese with this wine. Listen, he goes, what have I done? And to this day, what have you found in your servant as long as I have been with you that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my Lord, the king? Okay, now you got to stop, pause here and think to yourself, this is insanity for David to be saying this. They're about ready to march against David's own people. And he's like, why can't I go with you and fight with you against them? Well, see, he doesn't like that the lords of the Philistines have persuaded Achish in this way. And so, here's another important principle from this chapter. Don't be afraid to live for the Lord because of rejection from the world. The Philistine lords have rejected David. We don't like him. We don't want him marching with us. And David is like, why can't I? See, David is not really living up to where he needs to be in living for the Lord. He's more concerned about why have these lords of the Philistines rejected me? Why can't I go with you? Shouldn't even be with them. Shouldn't even be with them in the first place. Well, Achish stands firm about it. Verse 9, then Achish answered and said to David, I know that you are as good in my sight as an angel of God. Nevertheless, the princes of the Philistines have said, he shall not go up with us to the battle. Now, therefore, rise early in the morning with your master's servants who have come with you. And as soon as you are up early in the morning and have light, depart. And so David and his men rose early to depart in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines. And the Philistines went up to Jezreel. Now, notice this. As this chapter comes to an end, David is not returning to Israel territory. He's just not going to fight with the Philistines. He's not going to march with the army. So he goes back to Philistine territory where he was, where Achish gave him cover. And the territory he's about ready to head into, I'll put a map up here for us. Let's read chapter 30, and it'll tell us in verse 1. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag. Ziklag. And so here, here's Ziklag on the map. It's in the lower left corner uh, towards the edge of the map on the left side and closer to the Mediterranean Sea, more in, uh, more in the Philistine territory because at this time it's a Philistine uh, city. Now, it wasn't originally that way. Uh, when the land was distributed, Ziklag was a town that was given to the tribe of Judah. Now, David is a part of the tribe of Judah. So this is his ancient uh, territory uh, according to his tribal allotment. But at some point, it appears that the Israelites never successfully took Ziklag as part of the territory of the tribe of Judah. And so Ziklag remains in the hands of the Philistines. And this is where David retreats to. Now, it takes him three days to get there from wherever they were marching. Because it says that his men and he came to Ziklag on the third day. And when he gets there, notice this, this is a very tragic scene. It says that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire. And had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire, and their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. And then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail the widow of Nabal the Carmelite, had been taken captive. Now just... Pause there for just a moment. I want you to try to imagine this. Here, here's what's happened. David and his 600 men have been out fighting. He's, they've, been fight, they've been going with the Philistine army. They've been away from home. Ziklag is where the wives and children of David and his 600 men had been encamped. And while David was away with his men, the Amalekites came. 
Now, the Amalekites were also perennial enemies of the Israelites. Um, the Amalekites, in Exodus chapter 17, were a people who did not give the Israelites shelter or, or food when they were passing through the Sinai area when the Hebrew slaves were set free from slavery in Egypt and they were on their way to the promised land. In Exodus chapter 17, it says the Amalekites attacked them. And God took note of that, that the Amalekites had attacked his people in the middle of the wilderness on their way from Egypt to the promised land. And God did not forget that. But God was also long suffering with the Amalekites. He waited 400 years for them to turn and they never did. So, here in 1 Samuel, we read it several chapters ago, but in 1 Samuel chapter 15, God instructed King Saul, one of, your, one, is his, one of the first missions that God gave to King Saul when Saul became king, is I want you to destroy the Amalekites. And God specifically says, because they attacked my people in the wilderness. And he referred back to Exodus 17, which was 400 years earlier. So God said, I want you to strike them all. I want you to take them all. And Saul did not. He disobeyed God. And he allowed Agag, the king of the Amalekites, to live. And he took the best of the sheep and the best of the cattle. And apparently he didn't kill all the Amalekites because there was a few who escaped also. And he kept for himself, Saul did the best. Samuel the prophet, who was still alive at the time, confronts King Saul. He says, why didn't you destroy the Amalekites? That's what God told you to do. Saul says, I did destroy them. And then Samuel says, well, if you destroyed them, how come I hear the lowing of the sheep? Uh, how, come, uh, how come I, uh, sorry, the lowing of the cattle and, and uh, the, uh, the, whatever the sheep do, bah, uh, of the sheep. And uh, he's like, you know, if you really wiped them out, then I wouldn't be hearing all this. And Saul's like, well, you know, I kept a little bit for myself. And, and, and Samuel's like, yeah, and on top of that, you kept the king, Agag. So uh, Samuel's like, give me a sword. And Samuel kills the king Agag of the Amalekites to finish off what Saul should have done. And at that moment, God said to Saul, you've been disobedient to me and the kingdom's going to be taken from you. You're not following what I said. So I bring this up because the Amalekites have stolen, have kidnapped the wives, sons, and daughters. The people that should have been wiped out if Saul had obeyed God have now come to Ziklag when David and his men were away, and they've taken captive all the women and all the children. You, when you don't deal with the things that you're supposed to, it ends up costing you something. And so unfortunately, David is paying in part for what Saul didn't do. And they're beside themselves. I want you to imagine, I don't wish this on anybody, this would be a horrible thing. I want you to imagine leaving church tonight, going home, and your entire neighborhood has been burned to the ground. And everybody, all the women, all the children have been kidnapped by whoever came in and burned down your whole neighborhood. I mean, it would be devastating. It would be devastating. And it was so devastating that it says in verse 6, keep reading, now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. Okay, notice this. They're, they're holding David responsible. It doesn't record the conversation, but you can only imagine. If you hadn't hauled us out to battle with the Philistines, why are we even here, David? Like, we shouldn't even be here with the Philistines. If we hadn't been gone, if we'd have been here, we would have been able to protect our wives and our kids. Yeah, I know war demands that we have to go off and fight from time to time, but we shouldn't even be here. Now our wives are gone, our children are gone. And for all those men knew they were dead. Now they weren't, but that's for all the men knew they were possibly dead. And they thought of stoning David. We're going to kill you. And what does it say there at the end of verse 6? This is an important verse. It says, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. This is an important point from chapter 30. Boy, I hope it doesn't escape you. Here it is. Sometimes you may have to encourage yourself in the Lord when no one else can or will. There will be moments in your life, if you haven't already experienced it, when there's not another human being on the planet who can really 
minister to the deepest part of whatever is hurting in your soul except the Lord. And we love our spouses and we love our friends. Um, we love our kids. But there are just some times when they will not be able to or maybe don't have the capacity to um, minister to those deepest hurts, those places of greatest darkness and distress. Here David is a man who feels completely and utterly alone. All his friends want to kill him and his wives, he shouldn't have to, okay, but that's a whole other subject. His wives are gone and he's feeling completely and utterly alone. And it says here that David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Be prepared to do that if you haven't already learned to do that. Because there, there will be times that you, that, and it isn't even fair to turn to other people. Uh, because whatever you're going through sometimes is so deep and so devastating that other people can't necessarily even understand or comprehend your personal situation. I don't care how wonderful of a person they are around you. There are just some times that you're going to have to get alone with the Lord and say, Lord, you know, and no other human being can. And don't even try to think to yourself, you know, well, I've been through what you've been through. You know what? Every human experience is unique. And there might be some similarities that you can relate to another person concerning whatever their loss is or their devastation. But then there are these unique things that happen in one's life that is unique to that individual. And, and I just want to encourage you, it's okay if other people can't really step into your shoes and feel and understand everything you're going through, God does. And that's when you really need to learn to lean on Him, trust Him, press into Him, and encourage yourself in the Lord. This is what David had to do. Now I want you to see a couple of things that he did to help him, himself here in his uh, discouragement, how he strengthened himself in the Lord. So verse 7 says, Then David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, Please bring the ephod here to me. Now remember what the ephod was. The ephod was a priestly vestment. And in the priestly vestment, there were stones. One, was a st one stone they thought was either uh, painted white and one was painted black. And one, meant, one was called the Urim, one was called the Tumim. One meant yes, one meant no. That was the best they, they could tap into the understanding of God's will. Now we have the Holy Spirit. So now, and we have the Word of God that we can understand His, His will. But in that day, that's about all they had. Had. And so David, the first thing he says was, bring me the ephod. Why? Because he wants to inquire of the Lord. And Abiathar, and Abiathar, Abiathar brought the ephod to David, verse 8, so David inquired of the Lord. That's the first thing. He turned to the Lord saying, shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered, the Lord answered, pursue them. So he obviously pulled out the yes stone, pursue for you shall surely overtake them without fail, recover all. So uh, just these two things that are important. He inquired of the Lord and he acted instead of being passive. And, and here's why this is important. First thing is he turns to the Lord. He realizes I can't turn to all my friends. They're ready to stone me. I can't find another human being who's going to be able to empathize with everything I'm feeling right now and the loneliness and the desperation. So I, I, I have to get along with God. First thing he does is, priest, bring me the ephod. I got to inquire of the Lord. And that's, a, that's critical when we're going through something that no one else can really understand, whatever that deep thing is, that dark place in your life, and, or the loss or the grief or whatever it might be. It's like, get alone with the Lord. Fall on your face. Some of you understand this. You've been in places that you can relate to this when it talks about how they wept until they had no more strength. You know what it is to be on your face on the carpet of your bedroom, just soaking the carpet because there's, there's just no words to describe the intensity of the grief or the emotion that you're feeling. And these are grown men who are warriors, and yet they're so, so desperate and, and, and they're so grieved that these guys are just crying until they're at a place of complete exhaustion. And David is like, God, I have to seek you. 
And I, I have to know from you what to do because I don't know what to do. And so the first thing is he inquires of the Lord. And then I like the second part here where he says, what should I do? And God says, go ahead and pursue them because it speaks to us. The worst place when you're in a place of desperation is just to sit and do nothing. Because all that feeds is the constant desperation and the emotion of the whole thing. Like, like get up. It's, it might be hard, and, I, and I'm not pretending to walk in some of the shoes that some of you have walked in, but I am saying when you look at what happened here, like there's something to be said of just don't keep lying prostrate on the ground, like get up and, and, and do something. Go take a walk, take a drive, like move, like don't, don't just stay there. In that, in that place because it will eat you alive. And so David's like, you want me to do something? Tell me what to do, I'm gonna do it. And whatever the Lord tells us to do, we better do. Uh, because it's not good to stay stuck where we are. And so God says to him, I want you to pursue him, overtake him. And so verse, verse nine, so David went and the 600 men who were with him and came to the brook Besor where those stayed who were left behind. But David pursued he and 400 men for 200 stayed behind who were so weary that they could not cross the brook Besor. So out of the 600 guys who were in his army, 200 of them were like, I, we just can't go on. We're so depleted. And so they st 200 stayed behind. Verse 11, then they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and they gave him bread and he ate and they let him drink water. And they gave him a piece of cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And so when he had eaten, his strength came back to him, for he had eaten no bread nor drunk water for three days and three nights. And then David said to him, to whom do you belong and where are you from? And he said, I'm a young man from Egypt, servant of an Amalekite. Okay, so now David's going to get intel on where the Amalekites are. This is obviously a God-directed moment. And the Egyptian guy keeps saying, and my master left me behind because three days ago I fell sick. We made an, uh, an invasion of the southern area of the Ketherites in the territory which belongs to Judah and of the southern area of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. Okay, now David knows, okay, now this guy knows exactly what went down. He's going to know where they are. And so David said to him, can you take me down to this troop? And so he said, swear to me by God that you will ne neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master and I will take you down to this troop. And when he had brought him down, there they were, spread out all over the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil which they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. And so here they are, they're, they're eating, they're drinking, they're dancing. Obviously they're not Baptists. And uh, they... Uh, <laughs> And, but you know, these Amalekites, they're just partying and they're just enjoying the spoils here in verse 17. And then David attacked them from twilight until the evening of the next day. Not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. And so David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. And nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything which they had taken from them. David recovered all. Then David took all the flocks and herds they had driven before those other livestock and said, this is David's spoil. So in other words, God gave David even more than what he had lost. God is merciful. Now David came to the 200 men who had been so weary that they could not follow David, whom they also had made to stay at the brook Besor. So they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near the people, he greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless men of those who went with David answered, that's just an expression because the, this, the 600 guys, well, the 400 who went with him, you know, they, all of them were just a ragtag bunch. And so that's just uh, a statement about these guys were just a ragtag bunch, worthless men of those who went with David, answered and said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except for every man's wife and children, that they may lead them away and depart. So you, you see what's happening here. Like they, they've had victory. They've recovered everything. They're heading back. And David had gone with 400. 200 were too weak to travel and too distressed. When they meet up, the 400 said to the 200, we're not giving you anything. 
We're going to give you your wives and your kids, but you ain't touching any of the plunder because you guys didn't fight with us. But look at what David says here. Verse 21, but David said, my brethren, you shall not do so with what the Lord has given us, who has preserved us and delivered into our hand the troop that came against us. For who will heed you in this matter? But as, it, but as his part is who goes down to battle, so shall his part be who stays by the supplies. They shall share alike. And so it was from that day forward, he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel to this day. So that's smart. You know, David realizes, look, you know, these guys, they were too weary to fight, but at least they stayed with the supplies. They guarded those and so not everybody can go to battle. We're going to have to realize that some people have to stay back and defend what we're leaving. And so they're going to get equal shares. And so it says, now when David came to Ziklag, he sent some of the spoil to the elders of Judah to his friends saying, here is a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord to those who were in Bethel, those who were in Ramoth of the south, those who were in Jatir, those who were in Aror, those who were in Sifmoth, those who were near in Eshtemoa, those who were in Rakal, and those who were in the cities of the Jeremielites, those who were in the cities of the Kenites, and those who were in Hormah, those who were in Korashan, those who were in Athach, those who were in Hebron, and to all the places where David himself and his men were accustomed to rove. Here, here's what David is doing. He's a smart guy. First he goes, everybody among my 600, you're going to get equal share of the spoils. But on top of it, he sends back to his friends in the territory of Judah, to the Israelites and these various towns, gifts from the spoil, from the plunder. Why? Because David knows that by his decision to go down to Philistine territory, he has naturally alienated himself from his fellow Israelites. And so David, you know, a kind word turns away wrath. Well, so does a nice gift. And so he gives them gifts. He sends them gifts to help restore the friendship because he realizes they don't like that I've come down here to Philistine territory, so I'm going to give them some gifts and maybe that will help to uh, rebuild the strained relationship to what it once was. Chapter 31. This is a sad chapter, but here we go. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. And then the Philistines followed hard after Saul and his sons, and the Philistines killed Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malchishua, Saul's sons. The battle became fierce against Saul. The archers hit him and he was severely wounded by the archers. And then Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised men come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. Then therefore Saul took a sword and fell on it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his sword and died with him. And so Saul, his three sons, his armor bearer, and all his men died together that same day. And this is the end of Saul. This is how he dies, just as Samuel had prophesied, by the way. It's sad here on many levels, okay? But just to point out two little things going on here. One was David lost his best friend, Jonathan. Saul's son, Jonathan, was literally David's very best friend. And I looked back, when I got to this chapter, I looked back to see when was the last time David saw uh, Jonathan and what was their conversation like. And it was all the way back in chapter 23. Now, you don't, need, you don't need to turn there. You can if you want to. But the last time that David saw his friend, Jonathan encouraged him. Because David was on the run from Saul and, Saul, and so David and Jonathan had a meeting place in the wilderness of Ziph where um, they had this final conversation. Now, they didn't know it would be their final conversation, but it turns out it was their final conversation because Jonathan dies here in this battle with the Philistines on Mount Geboa. 
And Jonathan's last words to David back in chapter 23, verse 17, he said to David, do not fear for the hand of Saul, my father shall not find you. That's true. You shall be king over Israel. That part also will be true. And I shall be next to you. Even my father Saul knows that. And that part will not be true. Jonathan will never co-reign or in some way support David's reign as king because Jonathan dies here in this battle with the Philistines. But David also lost someone that he at one time respected. Saul was king and David respected him. When Saul was tormented by this demonic spirit, uh, David was the one who was selected to bring his harp into the palace and play music to help ease the depression that Saul was going through. And at one time, there was this somewhat closeness. I think David, you know, saw him as a man who obviously Samuel had anointed Saul as king. David respected him, even though there were two opportunities David had to kill Saul. He said, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. And even though Saul was a man who, who turned on David and wanted to literally kill David and tried to kill David, David still maintained this understanding that until God's done with him, I'm going to respect him, even though he's not living a very respectable life. So David had this respect for him. David, it was ultimately respect for the Lord uh, who had selected Saul for this time. And, you know, Saul was the guy who originally when David was ready to fight Goliath, Saul was like, here, take my armor. And, and Saul was a young kid and tried the armor on and said, no, 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 this is too cumbersome. It fits you. I'm just a little boy. And so, you know, but, but they had that kind of a relationship early on. And now he's dead too. The last, I, I looked back at the last conversation that Saul had with David, and it was also in the wilderness as if it's chapter 26. And it was one of the opportunities when David snuck into the camp where Saul was, and David had the opportunity to kill him, but he didn't. And then the next morning, from a distance, David basically says to Saul, I had the opportunity to kill you, but I didn't. And Saul's last words to him at the end of chapter 26, verse 25, and then Saul said to David, may you be blessed, my son David. You shall both do great things and also still prevail. So I was like, I, I know God's hands on your life. And you're a bigger man than I am. You could have killed me, not once, but twice. And I know God's going to use you. One day, you will prevail. That's the last thing that Saul says to him. And so this, this is a sad chapter, because Saul and his sons are now dead. And what's interesting, and we're not going to get into it tonight, but it appears that there is a, there's an epilogue in 2 Samuel chapter 1 that fills in some of the details of Saul's death. And it appears, and I'm just summarizing the next chapter of 2 Samuel chapter 1, it appears that when Saul threw himself on his sword, uh, it wasn't fatal, that he severely injured himself, but he didn't kill himself. The armor bearer apparently ki kills himself, but it seems, it appears that Saul is in the throes of death and he's lying there, but he didn't really successfully kill himself because in, in chapter 1 of 2 Samuel, it says that an Amalekite comes to David with the crown of King Saul, a young Amalekite. And he says, I killed King Saul. I killed him. And he tells this story about how he saw Saul in the throes of death, but he wasn't really dead. He says, I went over and Saul asked me to finish him off and I finished him off. And for that, David kills this guy. But that's, um, and next week Ronnie will be here, but that's for the next time we get together. But I point this out because when you look at how the Amalekites attacked Ziklag and all of that mess, and then an Amalekite is the one at the end of the day who kills King Saul. Boy, it's a reminder, I've shared this principle from a previous chapter here, but it's worth repeating. What you don't kill could end up killing you. And that's, that's 2 Samuel chapter 1, which we'll get into another time. But that's what ends up happening. It's an Amalekite. Saul was supposed to kill the Amalekites. The Amalekites ransacked Ziklag. And an Amalekite at the end of the day is the one who kills King Saul. King Saul was supposed to kill all the Amalekites. But he didn't. And so what he didn't kill, 
ended up killing him. There are things in our lives, if we don't, if we don't take up our cross and die to ourselves daily, there are things that could end up killing us. Well, look at how this chapter ends, and then we'll have communion together. Verse 7, and when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and those who were on the other side of the Jordan saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook the cities and fled, and the Philistines came and dwelt in them. And so it happened the next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. And they cut off his head and stripped off his armor. You know, they're just desecrating his body here to, to prove a point. And sent word throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim it in the temple of their idols and among the people. And then they put his armor in the temple of the Ashtoreths, that's their false gods, and they fastened his body to the wall of Beit Shan. So those of you who have been with me to Israel, Beit Shan is one of the places we go to. Here's, here's a picture of Beit Shan. Uh, now the, the ruins in the forefront of the picture are from the, the Roman Empire period because the Romans came in and they took Beit Shan as part of their Roman Empire. So the ruins there in the uh, front side of the picture, the near side, is ruins from the, the Roman Empire period. But it is, the, it is the hill behind that that I want you to notice because the hill behind that is called a tell. A T-E-L. A tel just means hill or mound. Um, Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv means hill of the spring. A tel in ancient Israel is a, a hill that is built because civilizations build on top of civilizations on the same city, on the same town. And so this ancient hill is, is, is con this hill is, is considered an ancient tell. That's where the original city of Beit Shan was. It's just the civilizations have built upon it. So forget the Roman ruins in the front of the picture because the period that we're reading about is when Beit Shan was somewhere along that tell. So if an archeologist were to take that hill like a pie or a cake, let's say cake, that makes a better illustration because you gotta have layered cakes, and take a, like a sliver of a piece of cake, you would see different levels of the civilizations, different layers. So that's ancient Beit Shan. And somewhere on that hill, at one time there was a wall. And on that wall, fortifying, you know, protecting the city of Beit Shan, the Philistines hung the decapitated body of Saul and his sons. And they did it to like trophies. They're, hang, they're literally hanging their headless bodies on the wall as a victory statement. We have killed the king of Israel and we have been victorious. And so verse 11 says, now when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead, now these are the Israelites, these are the people of another town, but these are Israelites of the town of Jabesh Gilead. When they heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men, bless their hearts, all the valiant men arose and traveled all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bashan, and they came to Jabesh and burned them there. And then they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree at Jabesh and fasted for seven days. And so they basically snuck in and took the bodies down and said, you, you will not mock our previous king and his sons, and we will take the bodies. They snuck in, they took the bodies down, they took them back to Jabesh Gilead, they burned them, and they gave them a proper burial. Now, I'm going to close with this and then we're going to share communion because this, this passage answers the question. A lot of people ask me constantly, is cremation okay in the Bible? And there are some people who are completely opposed to cremation. That's fine if that's your conviction. But here's an example of when they cremated Saul and his, and his bodies. And God doesn't speak out against this. So that becomes a personal choice. Here's basically a point that I'll leave you with the last point from chapter 31. We all return to dust, friends. Cremation is just faster than natural decomposition. Okay? To be exact, natural decomposition takes about two decades. Cremation at 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit takes about two hours. It's two decades or two hours. You're going back to dust. So it really is a personal decision. I tell people all the time, like, 
That's a personal decision. But this is an example in the Bible where Saul and his sons were cremated. It's not a sin because you're going to return to dust anyway. It's just as a matter of whether you speed up the process or let, let it happen naturally. This is how it all ends. It's sad. It's a sad chapter. But David now is going to wrestle in, uh, with the people in terms of their initial acceptance of him as king. Not everybody in Israel accepts him as king. Not the whole territory. But he will start to step into his role. And so there's much in 2 Samuel that we'll get to uh, soon enough. But for tonight, we're going to close with prayer and have communion together. So ushers, if you'll come, everybody will bow your heads. Lord, we thank you for this time in your word. And um, may we learn much from the tragic life of Saul. Uh, what a troubled, tormented man. And he tragically comes to an end here. And so, Lord, we, we just pray that you would help us to learn um, from the good of things we read in the Bible and from the bad of things we read in the Bible. That you would help us to live a life that just honors and glorifies you. And Lord, I, I do pray for those who are going through some ziklag moment of their own tonight and they're just in a very desperate place. Or maybe they're watching online. You know who they are. Lord, I pray that you would comfort their hearts. I pray that you would strengthen them. I pray that you would lift them up because no one else really can like you can. So help them, Lord, as they cry out to you, as they seek your face. And it is good, Lord, for all of us to come into your house, to close our time in your word with communion, to remember the cross, the blood that you shed, your body that was broken for us to save us from our sins. So be glorified, Lord, now, as we remember your, your sacrifice with gratitude, with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen.